On January 26, 2020, millions of people around the world were shocked to hear about the tragic news involving Kobe Bryant and eight others. Shortly after the accident, I had requests from many of my subscribers to do a video on the event. My first video talked about what happened. The second video I did talked about where it happened. And this third video is going to touch on why it happened or possibilities of why it happened. Because I don't know enough about it, I didn't want to do it on my own. So I spoke to some pilots. Pilots with thousands of hours of experience, both in fixed wing and helicopter. Dan Greider is one of those pilots. He is a retired airline captain who has a keen insight how things work when it comes to flying. Tell me about this Kobe Bryant crash. Uh, you've already been there a couple times? Uh, three times. It's about a mile and a half hike. Uh, it's not a bad hike. It's kind of long. It has some fairly steep sections of it. I just saw your video that came out about, is this the one where you hiked it and left the roses up there? Yes. I've, I've seen a bunch of the pictures of the site. The terrain and stuff doesn't really make sense to me up there. I'd like to go up there so I could see. If we hiked it, would you be able to show me the actual first point of impact site up there? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's right there. It's right there. It's the biggest mark. In fact, I, now it's the only mark. Yeah. Dan and I headed up there on a weekend that ended up having a record-breaking heat wave coming through the area. And right now it is hot. I got out of my car, the car thermometer said 114 degrees, which it feels like it's at least 114 degrees right now. We finally made it to the location, and after pouring some cool water on his face, then scanning the area, Dan had this to say about the incident. So we're up here at the Kobe Bryant ca crash site with my friend Forrest Haggerty, YouTube channel, standing right next to the spot here where I believe the first point of impact was in the Kobe crash, January of 2020. He also corrected a mistake that I made on my last video. I said the impact crater was probably made by the main rotor, but I was wrong. It was actually made by the cabin and the frame, or basically the body of the helicopter, impacted at that point at 184 miles an hour, creating that big divot. Dan continued with his analysis. Uh, the interesting thing is that the weather that day basically caught a pilot on top or in the clouds requiring him to do a fancy maneuver to get back. The only maneuver that comes to mind is the com commercial pilot maneuver called the steep spiral, which should never be used to get you out of the weather. A steep spiral is a tight left-hand turn down crazy to get out of the clouds or, or to go through a sucker hole. We got a couple things to talk about cause-wise on this accident. I got a couple of opinions on cause. It's gonna lie with NTSB as far as not being able to figure it out and not being qualified to figure it out. It's gonna lie with FAA in the underlying root cause of the Kobe Bryant crash. What Dan is referring to with regards to the National Transportation Safety Board is that out of the 400 employees at the NTSB, Three of them are pilots, none of them are helicopter pilots, and none of the investigators that examine the Kobe site are pilots. On the NTSB website, it says the NTSB GO Team, the purpose of the Safety Board GO Team is simple and effective. Begin the investigation of a major accident at the accident scene as quickly as possible, assembling the broad spectrum of technical expertise that is needed to solve complex transportation safety problems. Technical expertise would seem to mean pilots investigate airplane crashes and helicopter pilots investigate helicopter accidents. But the NTSB does not have any helicopter pilots on the safety board go team. There are five board members who head the NTSB. When there is a high profile accident, one of the board members is required to go with the investigative team. Jennifer Homendy was the board member at the Kobe site. Jennifer Homendy is not a pilot. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jennifer Homendy, and I'm a board member with the National Transportation Safety Board. In her biography on the NTSB website, it is stated that she completed private pilot ground school and holds a motorcycle M2 endorsement. A motorcycle M2 endorsement is basically a license to operate a moped. And it does not state whether or not she took the written test after completing her ground school. 
The job of the NTSB is to gather the facts and not speculate as to a possible cause to the accident until the investigation is complete. Parties to the investigation are entities that can provide technical expertise that will help us in gathering factual information. However, Jennifer Homendy seems to be speculating here at the last press briefing for the incident. I was asked about Terrain Awareness and Warning System, or TAWS, which provides terrain information to the pilot. I was asked whether that was on this helicopter. We have verified it was not. We issued a recommendation to the Federal Aviation Administration that stated, require all existing and new U.S. registered turbine-powered rotorcraft certificated for six or more passenger seats to be equipped with a terrain awareness and warning system. They did not implement the recommendation. In 2014, we closed the recommendation as unacceptable. Dan Greider had this to say. Terrain avoidance and awareness warning system would only alert a pilot on a predictive basis, predicting that he's about to get into terrain. A TAWS system at his altitude and his speed, he was going down the freeway at low level. This isn't a situation where TAWS is effective or that's not the design purpose of TAWS. And Jennifer, Hem Jennifer Homendy doesn't even understand what TAWS is or what it's for. What Dan is saying is that TAWS, Terrain Avoidance and Warning System, is an early distant warning system that can tell a pilot two to three minutes in advance what could happen to them. If a plane is heading toward terrain, the avoidance system will tell them they are heading toward terrain and give them plenty of time to avoid that terrain in order to avoid a disaster. Putting a terrain avoidance and warning system on a helicopter that flies close to the ground would not be effective because being so close to the ground, it would be going off constantly and one of two things would happen. Either the pilot would start to ignore it or the pilot would eventually turn it off. Former United States Navy helicopter pilot Ben Seal said this about TAWS and the Kobe Bryant incident. I mean, you kind of hit the nail on, on, the head, on the head with how it works. And in the 737, it's essentially, uh, it's like you're flying straight and level, and it looks out there and says, there's a mountain 15 miles away, and it starts giving you warnings, and it'll light up on your uh, radar display. It'll, it'll show up um, as like an orange or a yellow hashed out area. And then when you get a little closer, it goes, because when you're far enough away, it goes, well, if you do something now, we'll be fine. When you get a little closer, it, goes, it starts going, you better do something now, we're gonna hit this mountain. And then it turns red, and finally it gives you an indication that like, if you don't, if you don't put some sort of input in right now, you're gonna hit this mountain because your aircraft doesn't have the performance to clear it unless you start a, a maneuver immediately. And the way a helicopter flies, that's, I mean, the helicopter doesn't know, the pilot doesn't know what he's gonna be doing two minutes from now, let alone you know some system so right. i don't think it would have helped at all yeah. um i and i don't think you've run into very many helicopter pilots that would think that it would help at all um the only the only scenario where taws would be of any use in a similar situation is if they were on autopilot following an air airway or something like that which they most obviously were not because they were already down in a valley and uh, you know you would you would never set your autopilot down in a valley your hand flying yeah. Uh, so, yeah no no effect whatsoever toward the end of the NTSB's last press briefing even Jennifer Homendy's investigator in charge Bill English seems to politely and gently disagree about TAWS being the cause of the accident the question is, in what, at what point would TAWS have alerted the pilot? There's many variables here, and we don't even have a conclusion that TAWS and this scenario are related to each other. So that's a lot of speculation in that question, so that, that really can't be answered. So if TAWS is not the reason for the accident, then what happened? Let's start with what we do know. We know pilot Arl Zobayan had over 8,000 hours of flying time, 
and over 1,200 of those hours were in the same type of helicopter, the Sikorsky S-76B. We know he had a pilot instrument rating, and he was an instrument-rated flight instructor, which means he was more than qualified to navigate through the clouds that morning. What we also know is that Ara had been in trouble with the FAA in 2015 for flying into airspace he was not authorized to fly into in order to avoid weather conditions with poor visibility. The charter company he worked for was strictly a VFR company. Pilots have to see where they are flying in order to stay legal. The FAA does not allow the charter company to fly by instruments, which means in order for Arazobayan to stay legal, he is not allowed to use his instruments. When a helicopter pilot comes into a situation like this, there is a standard procedure helicopter pilots use. This is what Ben Seal had to say about it. It's a common standard uh, procedure in helicopter flying uh, to, if you enter an inadvertent IMC, to make a 180 degree turn fly for a, uh, a minute in the opposite direction before you go ahead and, and pick up a instrument clearance or before you take any other action just to try to get out of the, uh, the cloud. Dan Greider said the root cause of the accident lies with the NTSB and the FAA. He says the NTSB does not make proper recommendations in order to mitigate future accidents and... He says the FAA has rules and regulations that put pilots in compromising and dangerous situations. Here is what he has to say about the FAA. FAA told this particular helicopter operator that IFR in their helicopter, in other words, doing it the safe way, is illegal. They're a VFR only operation. They have, the FAA has actually made it illegal for this operator to fly safely. IFR in the helicopter would have been, and still is today, the safe way to go. This helicopter pilot was an instrument instructor. He had the instrumentation and the cockpit displays necessary to be able to control his helicopter in the IFR system, climbing, cruising, and descending. It's absolutely the safe way to go. What is the legal restriction binding the hands of the helicopter operator? It's the FAA that will not allow that helicopter operator to operate IFR. He had already been busted once for a similar infraction where he had a cloud encounter and they found out about it. Now, if you're a VFR operator and you inadvertently end up in the clouds and they find out, it is a big deal. The wrath of the FAA, if they find out that you did an infraction like this, this particular pilot knew that if he did that, it would cost him his certificate and his job and his livelihood. At all cost, he could not get caught being in the clouds. The safe thing to do would be save the lives climb up into the clouds and confess, I made a mistake, I'm in the clouds, I know I'm a VFR operator, but I'm, I'm now IFR because the weather closed in on me and he would be alive today. His MO that day was to turn around, do a 180 and get back to visual conditions that he had previously left. He did not want to get caught by the FAA doing the same thing that he had previously done and previously been in trouble for. The Sikorsky helicopter was fully IFR capable and so was the pilot. The only missing link here was the FAA's authority for that Sikorsky pilot to file and fly safely an IFR flight plan from point A to point B. If they had done that, they would be alive today, no doubt. You have pilots in fear of, of violation and losing their jobs over flying these helicopters into these conditions and getting in trouble. FAA and NTSB should develop an open program for amnesty on confessing, okay, I'm sorry I made a mistake, I don't do this every day, but here's the problem, and let an airplane climb and confess that they have a problem and get some help so that everyone is safe. This is recoverable because we can change policy 
where FAA and NTSB agree that doing the right thing and saving lives is how we recover from this. We don't force this pilot to turn hard left and turn around so that no one will find out about it. That's all that happened in this case. This is recoverable. Jennifer Hominy, I'm talking directly to you. Your letter of recommendation has to do with allowing the amnesty for pilots who arbitrarily accidentally get caught in bad weather to not beat them and take their pilot's licenses away because it happened. Is this preventable? Yes, this is preventable, and we should be working on methods of not beating up pilots who inadvertently end up into this and have to use maneuvers like the steep spiral to get down through the clouds because that's the only way that they know to find a sucker hole to get down. A steep spiral maneuver that is on the FAA commercial pilot test is not an acceptable maneuver for getting out of the clouds. The acceptable maneuver is to confess to ATC, declare an emergency, get some help, and land safely at the next available airport. There should be no paperwork and no penalty when you declare an emergency and confess. The FAA has it set right now where if you declare an emergency and confess and a non-instrument pilot and a fixed wing or a helicopter ends up in inadvertent IMC, there's gonna be paperwork, there's gonna be problems, and everyone is afraid to do it. This is the FAA and the NTSB who bear the responsibility of fixing this. This is what caused the Kobe Bryant crash. When I shared Dan's reason for what he thinks is the cause of the accident with retired U.S. Navy helicopter pilot Ben Seal, this is what he had to say. I think that's absolutely a possibility. I mean, it, you're kind of uh, flying a helicopter in that scenario that environment uh that kind of weather you're already kind of you're on the fringe of what's legal and what's not legal to begin with you definitely want to get the job done and, and you definitely don't want to get uh break any rules or anything when when you're doing it well i mean you don't want to get caught breaking the rules when you're doing it that's for sure on my last video about the incident i had hundreds of comments from viewers talking about the terror and fear the passengers must have experienced before the impact. However, due to the gravitational forces being pressed against their bodies, they never knew it, they never knew what was coming, and they never felt it. This is what Ben Seal and Dan Greider had to say about it. And I think that uh, the moment he realized he was in over his head uh, was probably a, a couple seconds before they impacted. And I don't think anyone on board uh, including the pilot up until those last couple seconds, had any idea the grave danger that they were in. Let's address the final moments of flight inside that helicopter. Kobe Bryant, his daughter, and the other passengers on board, um, for closure purposes, for people very closely related to this, the passengers on this flight would have never known the information that the pilot had the pilot only became aware that he was in trouble in the very last few seconds of this flight. The passengers would have never known, even though they're coming down at 6,000 feet per minute, that's not a sense that they would have ever been aware of. Their impact was so sudden and into the side of that, there was no pain and there was no suffering. Their lives would have been over instantly and they would have had no awareness or fear at any time that they were about to die they would have never known the official ntsb report for any accident usually does not come out for 12 to 18 months after the accident and dan Greider believes that the report they do come out with will be inconclusive and unimportant if they don't get some experienced pilot experts on the NTSB GO team to determine exactly what happened. Pilots like Dan Greider and Ben Seal have a very different perspective on what can cause an aircraft accident because of their flying experience. NTSB got almost everything wrong that's possible to get wrong. They speculated during the interview and press briefings immediately after this crash, they speculated 
they gave out information that was completely erroneous and they've missed the entire point. They yet to this day still don't understand what happened in the Kobe Bryant crash. Not having that type of experienced expert on the NTSB GO team is something that should be changed immediately because an experienced pilot expert will have a much better chance of knowing the exact cause of an accident, which is the only way the NTSB can make proper and effective recommendations. In addition to that, the FAA needs to immediately begin a forgiveness policy for pilots who encounter inadvertent instrument meteorological conditions or inadvertent IMC. Because if the NTSB and the FAA don't do something different, then accidents like this could and probably will continue to happen. How much did they clear missing the mountain by? I mean, oh, yeah, 20 feet, 30 feet. maybe 20, 30 feet. Yeah.